Yeah. No, don't say <laughs> Okay, so um, what I want to do, let me uh, recall. I want to do one more problem. So problems never hurt, right? Um, and I think I started on this. Uh, the potential, again, for um, um, in spherical coordinate system is k, or 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. In general, a l r to the l plus b l r to the l plus 1 p l cosine theta is summation. And I, I started uh, talking about this. So suppose you have an uncharged conductor, a, you know, a sphere, a perfect sphere. And then you immerse, um, so this is an artificial problem. You immerse this conductor in a, un, a bath of uniform electric field. So there is an external electric field, E, which is E0 in the z direction. So what's going to happen uh, in, in the conductor? There are charges that are free to move. Positive charges move along the electric field. Negative charges move away from the electric field. The conductor was initially neutral. So in total, it will remain neutral. However, there's a charge separation. So you will get a buildup. It sort of fades out here. That's why I'm separating positive charge and the same amount. So I, I put the, oops, these are negative charges. The reason this works is you have on the one hand, you might have this um, E external. So let me write this as external. And, but because of these charge separations, you will get an E internal. And the goal, of course, is we would want, I mean, the charges stop moving when precisely the E external and E internal are equal and opposite. So inside the conductor, the electric field goes to zero. So it's a constant potential. But as a result, what has happened? Now there's a charge distribution. So you can imagine that the electric field near the conductor, and this should be further away, this, this uniform electric field, the external electric field, should be further away. And over here, you would get uh, electric field lines to uh, bend. Let me look at uh, the figure in the textbook that will tell me how the field lines might look like. We're not necessarily going to graph them. Yeah. So, so over close to here, the field, you know, close to the conductor, the fields bend and far enough away. I don't have that much space, so consider this to be very far away. The field is, again, uniform. Uh, this being positive charge, electric fields emanate from it. And this being negative charge, electric fields impinge on this. So um, if, you, if you know, uh, so large enough away uh, from, from the sphere, this will be the electric field, very far away from the sphere. What potential generates this electric field? Well, that's simple. V0 should be minus E0 Z, because this is the the external, or I should say far, far, far away field. Because if I take the du partial derivative with respect to z and stick a minus sign, I get a zero, right? So far enough away, this is going to be the. I, I should say, maybe instead of v external, I should say v approaches that. 
Now, this would be a terrible thing to do, except for one simple note, uh, uh, observation. Z is nothing more than R cosine theta. Why is that? So if you have any R, this is Z, and this is cosine theta, R. And this distance is R, so it's R cosine theta. And that's even better because I can write this as E0 R P1 of cosine theta. So in particular, infinitely far away, we don't get to pick V equals uh, zero. It's not because of the uniform electric field. It is artificial, but the whole problem is artificial. Yeah? So the conductor itself is a equipotential surface. What we will do is instead, we will impose the condition V equals zero So this is a conductor of some radius r. The only way I can get the potential to go to 0 at a certain radius is if I have this to go to 0. And for, for, for me to get this to go to 0, I can, on, if I, I can only have p1 because of p1. So watch for it. I'm go there's only a1, right? So just by looking at it, what do you think a1 is going to be? Minus a0, correct? R1, P1. R to the 1. This is where I'm looking at. But then I want this guy to be 0. I'll only need terms. There are two of them. So I will pick A1, which is E0 minus E0, R, but I'm going to um, evaluate it on the sphere, plus B1 over R to the 1 plus 1, which is R squared, should be equal to 0. So what is B1? zero are cubed. So let's see if this will do the trick. V equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught minus E0 plus E0 over R cubed. Oh, this is R. This is R squared cosine theta. P1 of cosine theta is nothing more than cosine theta. And hopefully, I didn't make any algebraic mistakes. Let me. Oh, I have R cubed at the numerator, sorry. Let 
me first verify that I have not made any mistakes. Uh, yeah, if this is correct. So look there and ask questions. Yeah. How did you get the A1 and the Okay, see, any term here would vanish at infinity because it's 1 over R. The only terms that do not vanish at infinity but they blow up is this, these guys, all of them. But we know we don't want any other blow up than this because the potential should reach some functional dependence so that th this is the electric field infinitely far away. And just by inspection, this is minus E0 R, cosine theta is nothing but P1. So that means only the L equals one term is surviving here. Okay? Now imagine if I put other Bs, how can you make this term go away? Because if, if you have more than one L, P1 is different from P2 is different from P3. They won't factor out. So because only one term survives here, only one term can survive here. So, and more importantly, uh, need only L equals one terms. There are two terms. Okay? So this is at R equals R, V equals zero. And that's how I'm getting this condition. The first condition we don't consider the B term because that goes to zero. That goes to zero infinitely far away. The second condition would be satisfied. We already satisfied the A term, but now we're satisfying V equals zero on the inside with the B term. Yep. Yeah. Because now we have only play in B. So because there's only one A1 term, there can only be a B1 term. Because this has to go to 0 at R equals R. Look, if, if there's a B2 term, what would it look like? Plus, I don't care something, um, it'll be R cubed. P2 cosine theta. So that has to go to zero, and this has to go to zero separately. Well, if this goes to zero, this goes to zero. This going to zero is precisely that. If I want, I can add another B4 term, but that has to go to zero. So this is the potential. From the potential, you can get the electric field. You can also get the charge distribution on the conducting surface. I'd like for you to go through the example and find the charge. It's worked out in the book, but I'd like for you to calculate. So <clears throat> the other one was the potential when uh, small r is equal to the of r, right? The first one over there? No, this is as r approaches infinity. Yeah, so, so, right. So this will make sure that this happens. A1 being, so I'm just comparing coefficients. So I have, see, this has to be A1, R to the 1, P1. Right. So the only way that can happen is, right. Right. if I look at the first term. And why only the first term? Because look at this. This is only cosine theta. That's the first one. That's the yeah. first one, yeah. And all the other terms are orthogonal to it, right, by, by the integration. So you can kill all the other terms away. You cannot have a P2 term. So is this the potential at a distance r? No, this is at all r. This is true for r greater than okay. r. Okay, outside. Oh, outside. Oh, that's what we're finding anyway. Yeah, inside it's v equals zero by continuity. 
conductors uh, are equipotential objects. Conductors in e electrostatic equilibrium, they're equipotential objects. So if the boundary has V equals zero, well, the whole thing is V equals zero. Yeah? Okay, so now we're going to um, get into the last uh, topic of uh, the chapter. Very often, when you have a blob of charge, you don't care about the exact potential. You know, you any anything that you're looking at is a large distance away. And so, when you measure something, you only have a certain level of accuracy. So, what you need effectively is, uh, you know, is there a dipole moment attached to it? Is there a quadrupole moment? Well, what does that mean? Dipole, you might know from chemistry. But what, what does all of that mean? So, but, and, and if you want higher and higher order terms, they will be corrections. They'll be smaller and smaller corrections. One hopes. So how do you understand that? So what we will do today is study what's called a uh, dipole. And then talk about other more complicated objects. Potential due to a dipole. At the same time, I really have to tell you what a dipole is. So what we're going to do is the following. We're going to take a plus q and a minus q and put it a distance d away. So I'll, I'll make it symmetric. It's d over 2 above the z-axis and d over 2 below the z-axis. Okay, And then at any point r, I, I want to find out what the potential is. So the goal is at any point, The potential is due to two charges, so okay. Well, I can tell you the exact potential. It is K. Oh, yeah. So these are equal and opposite charges. It's almost like a neutral object has just separated. The plus charges went one way. The equal amount of negative charges went the other way. So this is KQ over, I shall call this, because of this plus charge, I shall call this R plus, and this guy I shall call it R minus, KQ over R plus minus KQ over R minus, and it's minus because Q is minus. So I can factor this out even, KQ 1 over R plus minus 1. That's the exact potential. Okay, that's the exact potential. But, well, fine. You, know, you can plot this all you want to any level of accuracy. Use a, uh, use a code and find the potential everywhere. But we'd like a nice expression that we can live with. Okay. And so a workable one, uh, if it's approximate, will be approximate. We don't care. should be good enough. Because we're going to watch this from very far away. You may have heard, for example, uh, water has a dipole moment. A, a mo water molecule. So if you hold a molecule right here, compared to the inner scale of the water molecule, how far are you? Infinitely far away. So do you care about exact potential? No. Okay, so we need to approximate these guys. I'll, I'll write it in detail for R plus, and then you know what's good for the goose is good for the gander kind of thing. Let, let me do it this way. This R, this R can be reached by going this way and then that way. So it is uh, D over two Z hat plus 
So now this is a vector equation. Correct? So to get to here, I can go this way, then that way. I want this because this is what goes over here. So r plus equals r minus d over 2 c hat. Let's uh, figure out the magnitude. All I need is the magnitude for this guy because look, there's no vector over here. So r plus squared is nothing more than this dotted by itself. So it is r squared, because r dot r is r squared. What is this dot by itself? d squared over? Huh? Two, two. Two, two. Yeah, if it is z, I would do this. Four. What's the next term? Minus R D cosine theta. And so Watch this. I need uh, r minus as well. So look, r minus. Because the, in the in the in this expression, it becomes a minus. So it be plus. I want to f pull out a r outside, so I would get r squared. 1 minus, let me write this term first, d over r cosine theta plus d squared over 4r squared. First two terms of the Taylor expansion. This is recall. If you don't recall, recalculate. When you, when you do Taylor expansion in math, you go, why am I doing this? You need it all the time. Yeah? So, then, our plus minus becomes, now I don't care about exact value. One minus, one, ha uh ha, -huh, plus minus d over two r cosine theta. I've done a couple of things. This came from this. This minus makes the minus plus plus minus. Then I have two, I have two. What did I do over here? I ignored it. This is one over r approximation. This is another, it's a lower order term. It's one over r squared. We're only looking for the uh, approximate solution. So we want to hang on to the biggest term. You might say, well, is this, isn't this the biggest term? Why do we need that? Well, this term is going to cancel. So we need the next one beyond that. So the potential now is approximately, I'm, I'm, I'm taking this expression, 
but I'm going to use the approximate values for here, so I'm going to make it approximately kq. Both of them have an r. Then I need the plus one first, one plus d over two r cosine theta, then minus one minus d over two r cosine theta. And then we finally get a nice approximate potential Q over R. What survives? D over R cosine theta. D over R cosine theta. So let me do it. KQ. Very often you write. V dipole. Now from this, you can compute the electric field by taking the gradient. We will do that, but that's uh, one section down. Yes. So, so let me let me do let me do from here to here, right? Good, good. I, I like those questions. So, squared plus minus is nothing but r minus d over two z hat dot r minus. That's what it means. The square uh, is the vector dotted by itself. Magnitude is the square root of the vector dotted by itself. r dot r is, by definition, r squared. Then this dot this plus d squared over 4, z dot z hat, z hat dot z hat is 1. Uh, and then I get this dot this and this dot this. They're both the same. So I would get minus 2 times d over 2 r dot z hat. The usual, if you have r and z hat. What's the angle between r and z hat? It's theta. So when you dot it, you would get the magnitude of this times the magnitude of this times the cosine of the angle. Magnitude of the vector r is r. Magnitude of z hat is 1. So 1 cosine theta. Yep. So this is nothing but r cosine theta. Recall the vector r is r times r hat. That's why r dot r became r squared because r hat dot r hat is again 1. Yeah. So there will be portion, uh, portions of the lecture, depending on how much you recall, that is not clear. So lesson is either ask in class or fix it right after class. Don't, don't wait till the next class. That's where things disappear. Yeah? So, if you have, I'll give you a better answer after the next section, but what is the telltale sign of a dipole, the potential falling off as 1 over r squared? So if you have a multimeter, and if you move some amount of distance away from it, then the potential decreases by a factor of distance squared. If you plot that graph and you fit it into a 1 over r squared graph and you're getting that level of decrease, that means that a molecule or any object would have. No, we, we, this is an ideal dipole. We'll write 
So maybe I should even mention this. This is the perfect dipole. Dipoles, water molecule certainly doesn't look like this, does it, Martin? So what do you do when you see a realistic dipole? Well, you study the next section. Questions? If, if we're like measuring it or anything like that, does that D term? Uh huh. Right. The D is the separation distance. Theta tells you the orientation, how, where are you measuring from relative to the axis of the dipole. Yeah? Uh, D tells you how much the plus charges and the minus charges have separated. You know? Water molecules, it, it doesn't look like this at all. If I recall, it looks something like this, right? Uh, H2, so I'm guessing this is H and H. Oh. So this is not quite that picture. That's OK. This is the ideal dipole. The next section, we'll do the realistic dipole and, and many other objects. So yeah. if, if D goes closer and closer to 0, yeah. we just can't use this form, right? Because then no, no, no. If it, the smaller the D, the better your answer. You know why? Because we have dropped this guy. So the smaller the D, the lower this number is. Because remember, this, is, this would go in the denominator. It's 1 over. So it is, we want for this formula to hold true, again, not in the next section, but for this formula to hold true, we want the charge separation to be infinitesimally small. That is usually not a problem because, again, you're looking at a chemical molecule, and the scale of the molecule is infinitesimally small. So this is good enough. This is sufficient in most every realistic case. But we'll be more precise in the next section because we can afford to be more precise. So there's a significant difference between a dipole that's infinitesimally apart yeah. and just a, like a, a physical dipole. Okay. Yeah. Because this may be small, but it's not infinitesimal. D is not going to 0. Yeah. But and we'll write a formula for this as well. So I, I don't think I can derive the formula uh, for what I'm referring to. And, but we'll do many things in one shot. But I, I can at least get started. So this is called multipole. We'll have a monopole, a dipole, a quadrupole, and so on and so forth. Higher moments, if you will. intentionally looking, so this is uh, some row. Okay. We're intentionally looking at the potential it's very far away, and I, you know, I can only use up so much of the blackboard, so it is very far away compared to the structure. The further away it is, the more accurate your answer will be. So first, let's write the potential in its exact form, and then let us approximate it. OK? So the potential, this is recall. K, isn't this true, guys? Rho of r prime 
over the separation distance, see k, q over r, but q is being replaced by rho d tau, volume. Total charge is ch charge density times the, inter um, the integration volume element, and then you integrate over the entire So again, what is this guy? This is R prime. That vector is script R, but we don't really need that vector. We just need the magnitude. So let's play the same game and write out, see this R is equal to R prime plus separation distance. So separation distance is R minus R prime. I'm integrating, oh, d tau prime. I'm integrating over, recall the uh, expression, huh? I'm integrating over all the prime variables. This R, where the potential is measured. And what's this guy? Where the charges are located. Integrating, see, this is nothing but like an integral version of kq over r. This q has been replaced by rho dv. So, I mean, if you had, why are we doing that? If you had q1 plus q2 plus q3, well, you'd be doing q1 plus q2 plus q3. But if you have a smooth distribution, you have to integrate. And every single time when you have a point charge, this over here is the separation distance. The distance from where the charge is located to the point where you're measuring the field. Yeah? The R prime variable is different for every... R prime variable is over here, and that is part of what's being integrated. Yeah? So R prime is being integrated. But this guy if, has an R prime in it. Why? Well, there it is. Otherwise, life would have been a whole lot easier if you just factor out the R, which is not being integrated. So our entire goal is to approximate this guy, this guy. So when you say uh, R prime of where the charges are located, are uh -huh. you referring to one of the charges in that block? No, no, no. So there are many charges. So uh, where every charge, so because you're integrating over all the charges, but you're locating it one charge at a time. And then you, inter you write the expression for any given R prime, and then you integrate over R prime. So if I were using a, a Cartesian coordinate system, and I won't, because it's a terrible mess, but it would be dx prime, dy prime, dz prime. Okay. So again, as usual, I need the squared. It is this dotted by itself. So I'd get r squared plus r prime squared minus 2r r prime cosine of alpha, where this messy angle alpha, alpha is not the angle measured from the z-axis. Yeah? 
because when I go from here to here, now where is alpha? Well, it's this angle alpha. So alpha is also going to be integrated over. So that's a big mess and not an easy thing to do. But at least one can write down the expressions and then understand a lot of things from it. Okay? So as usual, I'm going to bring out the r squared. So I would get, I'm going to take, well, let me do this. 1 over r equals, I'm going to bring out a 1 over r. So then I get one plus r prime over r squared minus two r prime over r cosine alpha. True? Because I have factored out an r squared. When I factored out an r squared, and then I take a square root, I just get an r. Correct? So this, very far enough away, r is a small number. Correct? So Griffiths uses a symbol for this. He calls it epsilon. It's a temporary symbol. It doesn't mean anything. It's not standard in notation. So epsilon, by epsilon, I literally mean this. Minus 2 r prime over r cosine. But the, the whole point is, no matter where r prime is, r prime over r is a small number. So then, it can be written as 1 over r square root of 1 plus So all you have to do is learn how to Taylor expand 1 over square root of 1 plus epsilon. So I can approximate this. I don't recall the Taylor expansion for 1 over square root of 1 plus epsilon. Could I get it? Yes. I can assure you after my second term, I'm going to stop calculating. But if I wanted to, I could find, if it's a homework problem and I've, I was in the class, I would find out to the next order and then uh, I'll take the lower grade. I'm not computing anymore. Or I'll use a software package. But we already know this up to, is that what it is? So we need a few more terms. That's okay. We can, you can use a software to generate other terms. I am not going to put these values in, huh? But it's there to tell you how, how the story forms. You can take this for granted. You can choose to verify this. And that's where the story ends today. I will pick, pick this up with this expansion. So good, I, I'm getting more questions. As I was saying,